Y'all remember that horrifying scene at the end of Toy Story 3 where all of the toys are headed straight for the incinerator? Well, Hans Christian Andersen primed me for that exact scene with his marvelously odd and terribly tragic tale, The Steadfast Tin Soldier. Except in Anderson's version, everybody burns. But the fairy tales with Liz. There was once, in the playroom of a very bougie family, a set of 25 tin soldiers. They were brothers, as they were all made out of the same tin spoon that had been melted down to create them. Spoon is daddy! However, there wasn't quite enough tin to finish the batch, and so the 25th soldier stood on one leg. Now, this disability did not hold him back. No, he stood straight and proud. Oh my god, never make me say straight and proud again. He had a smart red uniform, and he carried a shiny musket. And he was, as the best soldiers were, steadfast, stalwart, soldiery. The tin soldiers sat on a table that was covered with other playthings, as children have always been across millennia, messy little hellions. One of the other toys on the table was a marvelous paper castle. It had all these great little details, like it had a mirror as a lake at the center of it with wax swans swimming on top. It had intricate paper trees. But its most beautiful detail of all was a paper ballerina who stood at the door. She had a delicate dress made of tulle with a blue ribbon sash slung over her shoulder, and it had a big spangle on it. It was as big as her fucking face. She stood in a perfect attitude effacée. That was a horribly pronounced ballet term uh, when the dancer stands with one leg bent behind her. Our steadfast tin soldier one day looked across the table at the castle, and he saw the ballerina, and from where he stood, it appeared as though she only had one leg as well. And believing they had this in common, the tin soldier fell in love with her. Now, when I was a kid, I thought that was very sweet, but as a woman who has now been in the world of dating, I do read it a little differently. While I totally get his need for connection, I think he's assuming a lot here. Like, you know when you go out with a guy and he's playing Sublime in the car, and so you sing along a little bit to what I've got, because, you know, it's catchy, everyone knows that, and suddenly he is going on and on for 45 fucking minutes about the time he followed Sublime on tour, and you're like, oh, great, but you don't really feel a connection, so you refuse a second date, and when that happens, he's flabbergasted, like, he's like, uh, but we have so much in common, and you're like, what do we have in common? And he says, we both love Sublime, and you say, no, you love Sublime. Where was I? Oh, yeah, so the soldier did consider getting to know the ballerina for, like, a hot second. But instead of doing that, he laid down behind a snuff box so he could just watch her all day. It's giving Freddie Einsford Hill on the street where you live. And all the towering feeling Just to know somehow you are near Also, what the fuck is a snuff box doing on a table of toys? I get that we were pretty lackadaisical about exposing children to tobacco products back in the day, but that seems highly negligent. Well, after everybody went to bed, the toys would come alive and party. Of course, 24 of the soldiers had been put back in their container and they were all like banging on it like, let us out. But the 25th soldier, the steadfast tin soldier, was still lying behind the snuff box, peeping at his lady. But when the clock struck midnight, a fucking goblin jumped out of the snuff box because it wasn't a snuff box at all. It was a puzzle box that looked like a snuff box. Which actually seems worse, it's like candy cigarettes, like what are we doing? Anyway, the goblin sneered at the soldier. Hey, stop gawking at that lady! But the tin soldier ignored him. People stop and stare, they don't bother me. For there's nowhere else on earth that I would rather be. Very well, just wait until tomorrow. Well, that's fucking ominous. The following morning, the children had set the steadfast tin soldier on the windowsill while they were playing, and suddenly he fell out of the open window. 
Now, it could have just been a draft, but also it could have been that goblin because apparently he's the ballerina's bouncer. And the soldier fell face first into the cobblestones where his musket stuck between two of the stones. The kids upstairs ran down to find him, but they couldn't. They would have heard him if he had cried out, but he was too proud to cry for help while he was in uniform. Guys, don't let that masculine pride get you. If you are stuck ass up between cobblestones, just ask for help. But he didn't do that. He sat there through a rainstorm until two street urchins found him. They made him a little paper boat so they could race him down the gutter. But due to that recent downpour, the gutters were flush with water and probably poop. So all that water carried the tin soldier right down the drain where he met up with a rat and the rat demanded he hand over his passport. I don't like this rat. It's giving border patrol. It's giving rat cop. It's giving all rat cops are bastards. It's giving a crab. The boat sank and disintegrated, and suddenly the tin soldier was swallowed by a fish. He lived inside the fish for a bit, like Geppetto, except that he was all stalwart and steadfast. I don't really know why he had to be stalwart and steadfast. I mean, obviously it's because he's a fucking toy tin soldier, but also you're in a fish buddy. Just like, relax. But while he was in there, the fish was caught and put into market. And in a fabulous soap operatic twist, that fish was bought by the cook of the very same house that the soldier came from. And she discovered him when she was gutting the fish. So the steadfast tin soldier was cleaned up and returned to his spot on the table so he could keep ogling his lady love from behind the nose candy box. Let the time go by, I don't care if I can be here on the table where you stand. But apparently those kids weren't too grateful to have him back because one of them picked him up and literally threw him in the fucking fire. Anderson tells us that once again, the goblin could be at fault here, but I have to ask how? How does the goblin control the children in this land? I would like some more details, please. No? Fine. No information on this mind-controlling goblin, just a very tragic ending. See, as the steadfast tin soldier was melting away in the flames, the door of the room burst open and that gust of wind blew the paper ballerina into the fire as well. And she instantly curled away into nothing. The next morning, when the staff was cleaning out the coals, they discovered that the tin soldier had melted down into a little tin heart. But all that was left of the ballerina was that fucking giant face-sized spangle, which had turned to ash. Wow, that's the end. That is the end. Now, I'm not generally someone who gets into the morals and lessons behind fairy tales because they don't all have them. However, I do think there are some lessons to be gained from this one. For example, if you like someone, go and talk to them because any moment a sadistic toddler could throw you into the fire. I'm a little unclear, though, on why the ballerina had to perish. She truly did nothing wrong. She was just standing there. I don't think we should punish her. She could not make the first move. It was the 19th century. And what is the fucking deal with that goblin? All of that is to say that I love this fairy tale. I love it so much. Um, I find it so charming. And if I can be your fairy tale sommelier for a bit, uh, I would pair it with a lovely red and also with the happy prince and cry your fucking eyes out. Well, folks, that is all there is to say other than sign up for my free newsletter at this a place to keep up with any fun future announcements that are coming. I'll see you for the next fucked up fairy tale.